I'm quite amazed as to how, you know consistently I've chosen to preach my way from starting at the book of Romans and we're now in the book of Colossians. And then to open the scriptures this week, to study this, to bring it to you this morning, to find that God has just overtaken me again. And the very words that we're about to read just dovetail incredibly perfectly into where God has already spoke to us this week. That's quite amazing. I don't think we should be amazed, but the voice of God is always consistent, isn't it? And uh, we need to get to that place where we're hearing his voice. My sheep hear my voice. So, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and Timothy, his brother, to God's holy people in Colossae, the faithful brothers and sisters in Christ, grace and peace to you from our Lord God, our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Because we've heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all of God's people. The faith and love that springs from hope stored up for you in heaven and about which you have already heard in the true message of the gospel that has come to you. In the same way the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world, just as has it been here doing among you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. You've learned it from Epaphrodites, my fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf and who has also told us of the love of your love in the spirit for this reason since the day we heard about you we have not stopped praying for you Paul makes it abundantly clear that he is praying for this church and uh, I know that we have a, a commitment to be a house of prayer and I know that many of us are stirred to come out on a weekly basis and pray but I still don't think yet we have grasped the enormity of the power that we have when we begin to pray. I think there's something in us that needs to grasp a whole bigger concept of what God does when his people pray. Because this apostle, you'd, you'd almost think it, it was useless. Prison, chained up between the guards in a very, very dark and dingy cell with rats running around, not in a good place. And yet his heart always, he's not to be sitting there and moaning, or sitting there and saying to God, if only I could be with them preaching, he gets on his knees and he cries out for them because he knows his prayers are shaking the heavens themselves and God is moving on behalf of the church when he begins to pray. And that's where we need our hearts to be. Sometimes we just think, well, you know, if only I could get up there and speak off the pulpit or if only I could be doing this. Listen, start praying. When we pray, God moves on our behalf, seriously moves on our behalf. I'm absolutely convinced, and we've shared this many times, Rob and I, that when we get together in that little room there in the front, that somehow we rearrange the furniture up in heaven, that spiritual things are happening when we're crying in the natural. So, you know, that, that's what he does. He wants to pray for the people. And uh, he says, we always thank God for you, our Lord, of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. And the great thing here is Paul is not praying out of desperation. Sometimes we pray for people because we're desperate, aren't we? Uh, we're desperate for them or we're desperate for ourselves or we're desperate to see something happen. But the prayers that Paul is offering up on behalf of this church here are not born out of desperation. He's, he said, he's been praying out of the fact that he's been encouraged. He said, because we've heard of your faith in Jesus and the love that you have for all the people of God. The two key things that you know, we've preached about and taught about and thought about over these last months about loving God with all of our hearts and loving our neighbour as ourselves. This is being demonstrated in, the, in this church here, and Paul is getting excited. It's stirring up his spirit to say, if a church can love God passionately, and a church can love each other passionately, then the sky's the limit for them, and I'm backing them in prayer. And we need to get stirred up to pray, not just because it's bad, because it's good. And at the moment, friends, it's good, and we would see want God to do more than he's already doing. So we need to get stirred up and get passionate about what God is doing and he's, he's, this faith has come contagious because it's come from testimony and it's imperative isn't it that we have great testimonies because when people begin to share of what God has done for them doesn't it begin to stir your heart to believe he can do it for you you know that's why I had Steve and Liz come out this morning because they know more than anybody else that God can see you through a very dark time when you've got a baby that's not forming properly or comes very early and all the rest of the stuff and God's a good God and we need more and more to inject testimony into our services because it just declares God's blessing and truth. And we begin to rise in faith about what God is doing for us. And God wants to drive a real passion in our faith. And he talks about this passion coming from the understanding 
of the gospel. He says, the faith and love that springs from hope stored up for you in heaven, about which you've already heard in the true message of the gospel that has come to you. You know, we are, those are a privilege to be those that have the gospel this morning. And the true gospel sets people free. The truth will set you free, that's what the scripture says, isn't it? When we preach the gospel in its, in its entirety and with clarity, it brings hope, it brings liberty, it brings joy, it brings healing, it begins, brings forgiveness, it brings the very presence and the power of God into our services. You can say amen if you really want to. That's sort of kind of, but that, when we do that with the gospel, you know, the gospel is supposed to be powerful, it's supposed to bear fruit. Religion, on the other hand, makes us harsh and judgmental. But when the gospel is preached, when the truth is preached, it sets people free. We're in the business of setting people free this morning. That's the call upon our hearts. And this apostle is incredibly stirred up. One, because of his heard of their love for each other and for God. And the fact that they've grasped hold of the fact that the gospel is powerful and it changes lives. No wonder he's praying. No wonder he's praying day and night for them because he sees that there's a revival going to happen there. He sees there's going to be a major breakthrough if these saints will just keep on doing what they're doing. He says to them, in the same way the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world just as it is doing among you since the day you heard of it and truly understood God's grace. The gospel always bears fruit. Unfortunately, the gospel has been watered down in our generation. And compromises come in. And so something that looks and smells like the gospel, but doesn't have the power thereof, has been preached by many pastors and many preachers. But we are those committed in this church to preach it like it is. Because we believe in the power of the cross. And we know sin's sin. And we know the devil's the devil. And we know hell's hell. But we know the blood of Jesus Christ can cleanse us from all sin. And uh, that's where we're at. And we are going to continue to preach it. And you know what? That will become increasingly more unpopular. People will find other words. But there, there are no other words to be said. You know, as we break bread, he said, do this in remembrance of me. This is my body broken for you. This is my blood poured out for you. You can't cover that up and just say, oh, we all have a few needs. We need to come to somebody that can help us out. Listen, we're all sinners and we need a saviour. Let's not kind of make it all kind of fuzzy and nice. The gospel is an offence. And sometimes it needs to get into people's face and rankle them before they actually come to faith. You know, Some people need to slam the door into our face a few times because the gospel is the gospel is the gospel. It's a stumbling block. And some people don't like it, but we need to keep on preaching it anyway. Because the truth of that gospel will ultimately set people free. And I prayed it this morning in the front room which is great because all the kids were in the crash, so they've overtaken us, which is brilliant. <laughs> but we need to expect the unexpected when we preach the gospel. You know, we don't want things to be as they already are. Uh, you know, what I like about church over these last few months, what God is doing among us, no service seems the same to me. That God is doing something a little bit different every time we gather together. And for, for that, we, we praise his name. You know, we don't want to get into some kind of liturgy or some kind of bound service where it always looks the same. We want God moving among us by his spirit. And the Bible says about the Spirit of God, it moves and blows where it wants to. You know, God is at liberty. We, Holy Spirit, we tell you this morning, with all of our hearts, you're at liberty to come and do what you want to do. This is your church, and you build it your way. He talks about this gospel. He says, you've learned it from Epaphroditus, our fellow worker, fellow servant in Christ, on behalf of those who told us about your love in the Spirit. He's honouring this preacher. He's, he's, this preacher has gone out, and he's, he's preached the gospel in Colossae. And now there are reports back about the fruit to Paul. But he calls him a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf. Not only has he truly preached the gospel, he's part of a wider apostolic team that have love and care for this church. And here's the big point here, is that the New Testament never shows us lone range of ministries. We believe in anointed teams of people functioning in love, united in the gospel, that the gospel might get preached. It's not about just me standing up here this morning. If it's, if it's down to all I can achieve, then we're really, really up the creek without a paddle. We stand together, united in the gospel. And it's quite clear as you read the New Testament, it never was about some megastar preacher. We've made it about that way. And even the Christian media has kind of made celebrities out of some of these big preachers. But I'm telling you what, the next revival that is the last revival, I believe, that's coming on the face of the earth, 
will be a faceless revival where normal men and women, boys and girls in church, lay hands on the sick and see them recover because it's the anointing of God that makes the difference. It's not about some superstar up here. It's about the church being who they should be. The body of Christ. We are the body of Christ, aren't we? He's the head. So every part of the body should be flowing in that anointing and a blessing. And if it comes down to one or two anointed individuals, no wonder, they, no wonder they've fallen and failed. They've started to believe their own press, that they're bigger than they are. Listen, we are what we are. I've often said what I am under the anointing is not what I am. Hear it. What I am under the anointing is not what I am. Go and talk to my family, they'll tell you. We went car shopping yesterday. I've never read so much in all my life. What we are under the anointing is not what we are. So pray for Josh, because he's not going to get a car if we don't sort ourselves out. So. <laughs> Paul calls him a faithful member. He calls him part of the team. You know, God's not up for superstars. In fact, teamwork is one of the, the things that, that God's good at. You've only got to read the Old Testament, even the early parts of the Old Testament. God's a team, isn't he? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Every time he comes down, he has a conflict, a conflict between himself, and they have a little chat, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They did it at the Tower of Babel. They come down. He says, they came down. They had a look. What these people do is not good. You know, whatever they've purposed will be, not be impossible for them. We, we need to do something here. God is big on team, and he's big on team because it brings about an accountability and a strength that we don't have on our own. You know, um, and I'll tell you, and great to hear about, about what happened to Bilston yesterday. You know, things like that don't happen by one or two people. It takes a team, doesn't it? always takes a team to build something bigger and stronger in God. In fact, I'm not, I'm not massive on big mega churches, but Brian Houston, you've got to admire what he's done with Hill Songs. He says this, our church is not built on the talents and gifts of a few, but on the sacrifice of many. And I think we need to let that trickle into our consciousness this morning, that this church is not built on the gifts of one or two of us, but on the sacrifice of many. And I'm so blessed to see some of you getting involved with Youth Alpha and prayer and all, all the other stuff that's going on because we need you there. Because if you take your place, then things will change. We need you. We need to get... And it was wonderful, uh, just as a little an aside and an update, on Wednesday to have 25 preachers at the Beacon Centre and apologies from another five that couldn't make it. So we've got 30 people in our church that have a hunger to preach outside this church and be a blessing to those little churches, Gloria has just spoken about, which was the whole essence of what I shared on Wednesday night. So keep on praying. Not only that we would be anointed and blessed to go, but we'd have opportunities and doors would open to us that we might be a blessing to other people. And he told us about your love in the Spirit. He's, he's commending them here for the unity that they have. And he uses this phrase, this unity and love that they have, and he uses this phrase, in the Spirit. We're united this morning in Christ, aren't we? The uniting factor of why we are here together this morning is because of what Jesus has done for us. And he's done everything that he has done for us by the Holy Spirit. He sent his Holy Spirit to save us, which is on the inside of us. He's the deposit of our inheritance. The, the unique mark that we all have as believers this morning is the deposit of the Holy Spirit. That's what unites us. That's what makes us the same. Because in many ways we are so, so different. It always amazes me at the odd, eclectic bunch we have here in Sedgley. But God has brought us together for one purpose and one person because we belong to Jesus. And um, it's really, really interesting. See, I, I, it's my opinion that you will never find unity of doctrine or practice. But we're united because we're part of the Lord's family. And we, we should be united by this fact alone that Jesus said that the only way this world will know that we're truly his disciples is if we love one another which is a huge challenge because we'd rather feel a bit, little bit more like, well, by this will all men know that we, uh, these disciples because we've got the right set of doctrines or we do the right things. But, you know, it's, we'll never agree on every tiny bit of doctrine and we certainly won't agree on styles of worship. There are thousands of de denominations being formed out of people just disagreeing slightly about practice and doctrine. We are, of the, we are of the persuasion, we call ourselves Protestants. That means we're protesters, and boy, have the Protestant church protested throughout the centuries. Split itself so many times, it looks like a chopped a bunion. I couldn't think of a better word to, to use there. But we have really dissected ourselves. 
and the world's not impressed. You know, people, get, people often say to me, and what, you know, when I go around a funeral or see somebody about something pastoral who's not a Christian, who, who uh, well, what, church, what sort of church do you go to? There should only be one church, shouldn't there, really? Uh, and, and, you know, we have to kind of try to explain the difference between, but, well, you're not the Church of England, no. You're not a Methodist, no. You're not Baptist, but I, I believe all of the stuff those people believe, and some more as well. You know? And we all love Jesus. Just, but they're not getting it, you know, they're just... Uh, because they, they want to see the love that we have for each other. And um, it's from loving relationship which is the key to the power of the church. And uh, I, I've come to this conclusion, and, and you can disagree with me if you like, but all the rows in church I've ever known have either been over a little bit of doctrine, the way we do things, so that's practice in it, or people feeling they've been overlooked. And if we will not just have a culture of honour, but have a culture of love, then none of those things matter. We always disagree in families. Families disagree about absolutely... Me, you and my dad the other day. We, we disagree on absolutely everything, but we love each other. And we bicker and we banter, and, but listen, we love each other. And that ha is how church has to be. Not that we split at every slightest little thing. The pastor didn't like what I had to say to him and has ignored me. It's not that if I have to listen to everything that anybody said to me, I'd never run this church. I'd have turned the bus around 15 times. You know, which I'm driving a bus under the anointing of God's Spirit and I want you to stop on because we're going to some places that you've never been to before. But if you keep shouting, turn it round, we've, we've missed the turning, then I can't do what God's asking me to do. But you, I believe collectively, if we love each other, you know, that, that, that the voice of God's Spirit will convince us all. And we might not always like it, but we love each other, so we'll let it go anyway. You know, we have to be family, and I can't I can't stress this any more than I'm stressing it, because that that is I believe is what is partly making the differential here, and and the church is growing, and we want more and more people to go. But we want the new people, the unsaved people that are about to come, to come in and go. Wow! So that's what it's like to be a Christian. You love people, and you love God with all your heart. I get it. Not that I adopt this set of doctrines or this set of practice. Not that I become religious, but I become a lover of people and a lover of God. Isn't that the, the greatest two commandments? We don't grasp that. We don't grasp anything. You can be doctrinally correct in, in every way for me, but if you don't love me and you don't love the church and you don't want to stand here and defend it, then go find somewhere else. And I say that in all love. But that's not what we're building here. We've got to build somewhere that people feel valued and loved and wanted and used. And you might not be able to do everything that you want to do, but by the grace of God, let's help us you do something that, you want, that we can help you do, and let's get on together. That's the whole essence of what we're doing with the preachers, and I haven't got enough time to go into that. For this very reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continue to ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives so that you might live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that we might have great endurance and patience. Here, Paul prays one of his profound apostolic prayers. One of the great, great, great men of the Bible. Prays some stuff. So when he prays, he's kind of worth taking note of what he's praying, isn't it? And this is what he prays that God would continually, he says, I ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will and the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives. What he's saying is, I'm praying for you as a church that you might really buy into what the vision is that I have for you, that the purpose that I have for you, and that as individuals you'll understand in that big vision where you actually fit. None of this is new stuff, is it? We looked at all of this when we talked about the body and various parts playing their part and not every part being different, and every part needing the other parts, even though sometimes we don't think we do. This is about understanding what, where God is taking us, and then understanding also where God wants to put you as an individual. Because I tell you what, when you plug into your purpose, boy, we become a whole lot stronger. When we function as a proper body, you know, that's when we're going to see the power of God released. I really do believe that with all of my heart. He wants to, and he says that comes by the Spirit. It only comes by revelation. We want that constant flow of the, the word of the Lord in this place that all of us understand what, what it is that God has got for us and what God wants for us. So that you may have a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit 
in every woodwork, growing in the knowledge of God. He prays that once they know what God's will is for them, that they will bear fruit. And the key to spiritual blessing and prosperity isn't sacrifice, it's obedience. Some of us want to sacrifice because it makes ourselves feel better. But sometimes we just need to say a resounding yes to what God has called us to. And some of you are struggling with that because you don't really want to do what God is prodding you to right now. But I'm telling you what, there is such a blessing and release comes when you say yes to God and obey him. And I'm, I'm challenging you, whatever it is God has called you to and laid upon your heart, and it may be over many years, just go for it with all you've got. And if you don't know how to, how to make that happen in your life, come and see one of the leaders and we'll pray with you. We want to see a church connected with God and connected with each other. The amazing thing is that every member, every part of my body is connected to the head, isn't it? My head gives it directions. When I'm moving my hand like that, my head's telling it to do that right now. My foot's not telling it to do that. Or my elbow, the head. And if we're hearing from the head and we're understanding what he wants for us and we're connected to him and we're all moving in sync, boy, we can become some kind of athlete in God, can't we? And run this race and get it done. And see this town won for Jesus. He wants us to be fruitful. I've often said, in many churches, there's often said, oh, that, that, that brother or sister was incredibly faithful. And there's an element in, if you're going to be fruitful, you have to be faithful. But sometimes, you know, we've had people who've been very faithful, but not very fruitful. I, I don't want it to be said in my life, well, he, he turned up at every service. He was a good pastor, you know. We had him for like 45, 50 years, you know. And he, he was a good old egg, but he didn't really build much. What, what, what kind of story would that be like on my deathbed? Think, well, I could have done so much more with my life. I wanted to do so much more. I want to bear the fruit. And, and the scripture says fruit that will last as well, not just kind of stuff that just bubbles up. Thank God for the excitement around the place now. But 20 years from now, pray to God that we've got far more hundreds of people everywhere on campuses all over this town, people saved and healed and delivered, and we're more excited then than we are now. Yeah. I, I don't want some fruit that just pops up today and is gone tomorrow. Growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, that we might be, have great endurance and patience. He wants them to grow in the knowledge of God. And you know what? True, true walk with God, you know, produces something. It produces endurance and patience. And the mark of true spiritual people is they've learnt to fight through with God. And they've, they've learnt to be patient. And sometimes we want it instantly, we want it today. But if we're going to build something of quality that's going to last here in Sedgley, we need just to keep on being patient and enduring it out and keep on taking up that cross every day and following Jesus and keep on churning out the prayer meetings and keep getting here and praying. Because there is coming a moment where God is going to break through for us and it's sooner than we think. But, but regardless, when he has broken through, there's still some more after the breakthrough. Don't, don't, you, don't, don't ever think that that's the means to the end, that somehow you will get a little blessing in your life and say, oh, thank God, he broke through for me, that's what I've been praying for. Well, how about the thousands of people out there that so desperately need a breakthrough, you know, whose lives are in a complete and utter mess? Well, we just need to be patient and endured. And, you know, so I'm, so, I'm so glad Paul wrote that for us this morning because it just dovetails into everything I've been... So in the last few weeks, I, I still can't get on my head open that I can open the Bible and it just carries on. But God is wonderful. And his word is getting stronger and his anointing in his presence is getting stronger in this place. And I want you to be part of this. I, I don't want you to sit on the sidelines and feel that you not have a part. Everybody has a part to play. It's not built on the talents of one or two. But as, as he said, on the, on the sacrifice of many. Can we just pray for a moment and then we're going to come worship the Lord and come around his table. Part of, this, part of this table is that we discern the Lord's body and we're the Lord's body. So there's an element in which we thank him for all he's done and, and his sacrifice on Calvary. But there's an element in which also we love each other and we find our significance and place together. So we actually break that loaf and have you take your little bit, you're saying, I'm a little bit of this big thing that God's got for us. As you take that cup, you're saying, I'm part of this that Jesus has done on Calvary. Father, as we come right round to your, around your table. Thank you for your word. And I just pray right now that you just release your presence upon us, that we would take our stand. Lord, we have come here because we want to be owners, owners of your blessing, owners of your love, owners of your purpose. And so help us to do that, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.